All right. I think we might go ahead and get started here. It's uh, wonderful to see you all. Uh, I'm David Meyer, the Dean of the Law School, and it's my great privilege to welcome all of you uh, to a very special occasion. Uh, and this is a very special occasion for two reasons. Uh, first, uh, the Dreyfus Lecture in Civil Liberties and Human Rights, uh, which we celebrate this evening, uh, is uh, the oldest uh, and one of the most distinguished uh, lectures series here at Tulane Law School. Uh, and this is, in fact, the first time that we've been able to hold this lecture uh, in uh, th uh, three years. Uh, so this is a, really a great celebration to be able to resume uh, one of the uh, richest annual traditions of the law school of uh, holding this lecture. Uh, but this uh, evening is also uh, doubly special because uh, tonight's lecture uh, serves as the kickoff uh, for Tulane Law School's Black Law Alumni uh, Reunion Weekend. Uh, and this is also the, the first time we've been able to resume this celebration in four years. Uh, it's meant to be a three-year, every three-year celebration. Uh, and so we're thrilled to be able to uh, have the celebration and we're anticipating a return of uh, nearly 300 uh, alumni, students, uh, and guests have re registered for uh, the reunion weekend. Uh, and uh, so we this kicks off now four days, almost four days uh, of programming and panels and lectures uh, and celebrations and parties. Uh, and so we're excited to uh, to welcome all of you who are uh, back for uh, for the reunion weekend back to Tulane. Uh, and uh, to all of you uh, back for this lecture. Uh, the lecture series is dedicated uh, to the memory of two persons of enormous conviction, uh, courage, and vision, George and Mathilde Schwab Dreyfus. Uh, the values they held dear, uh, free speech, racial equality, justice, and fair play, should, of course, be considered unremarkable uh, in America, but George and Mathilde Dreyfus fought valiantly for these uh, values at times and places uh, that made what they did uh, remarkable indeed. In the dark days of the Great Depression, as anxieties of war swirled and suspicions of disloyalty uh, fell too easily, George founded the Louisiana League for the Preservation of Constitutional Rights and fearly, fearlessly stood up for victims of political persecution uh, and police brutality, many of them uh, persons of color. 20 years later, uh, with his beloved wife, Mathilde, he founded Louisiana's uh, affiliate of the ACLU uh, at the height of the McCarthy era. And together they fought unflinchingly uh, for racial justice, uh, desegregation, and freedom of conscience. Uh, Mathilde, in her own right, uh, led the fight for good government as president of New Orleans League of Women Voters. Uh, they were driven by a powerful sense of right uh, that led them to risk their own uh, welfare, fortune, and physical safety. In 1960, uh, when Ruby Bridges braved a mob to enter the William France Elementary School here in New Orleans, she was accompanied not only by the U.S. Marshals, depicted in the iconic Norman Rockwell painting, uh, but also by the Dreyfuses. George volunteered to walk the gauntlet with her, uh, and Mathilde ferried children to school in her car, her license plate recorded and reported in the newspapers. When the state legislature cut off funds uh, to pay teachers' salaries in integrated schools, the Dreyfuses secretly fronted $16,000 to pay the back wages of 55 teachers and staff to keep the schools going. In the 1950s, racial injustice was, as Norman Rockwell titled his painting of Ruby Bridges, the problem we all live with. For George and Mathilde Dreyfus, it was a problem they did something about. After George's passing in 1961, uh, Mathilde and her sons generously endowed this lecture series devoted to the cause of civil liberties in his honor. In 2003, uh, the lecture series was renamed to honor uh, Mathilde as well, you know, recognizing their common cause and sacrifice. We're uh, extremely pleased uh, to be joined uh, at tonight's celebration of this lecture uh, by Professor Darren Hutchinson of Emory Law School, 
Uh, and unfortunately, as you can surmise from the scene before you, uh, Professor Hutchinson was uh, uh, diverted by circumstances beyond his control uh, and unable to uh, travel here to be with us in person, but he has valiantly agreed to uh, deliver his lecture uh, remotely, for which we are most grateful. Uh, and before turning over the podium to uh, my colleagues, uh, Professor uh, Surumatambanadso and Robert Wesley, uh, to uh, introduce Professor Hutchinson, I want to just take this opportunity uh, to express uh, the appreciation of the entire Tulane Law family uh, to the uh, uh, Dreyfus Schwab family. Uh, and we're honored to be uh, joined tonight here in the room uh, by Tom and Ann Schwab, uh, who uh, always uh, have been stalwart personal supporters uh, of this lecture, uh, and other members of the Schwab Dreyfus family who are joining us online and through the live stream, uh, who have also been uh, enormous and passionate supporters. Uh, of this cause. So with thanks to them and to all of you for being here, happy to turn over the podium to uh, Robert and Saru. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Um, to the annual, or mostly annual, <laughs> George Abel and Mathilde Schwab Dreyfus Lecture on Civil Liberties and Human Rights. For those of you who don't know, I am Professor Robert Wesley, and I have been a member of the Tulane Law Faculty since 1995. That's 28 years. <laughs> um, during which time I've taught courses in professional ethics, constitutional anti-discrimination law, law and literature, and critical race theory. So my name is Saru Matamadadzo. I am Moises Stieg Jr. Associate Professor of Law. I have been here slightly less longer than Robert. Um, I think though it's 13 years, lucky 13. Um, and I teach um, all sorts of classes related to gender and equity, gender law and policy, feminist legal theory. I taught a race and con law class this year. I also teach, you know, whenever, if it's, it's needed, uh, business enterprises, employment law, employment discrimination. I'll be taking over labor law this year. Um, so Professor Wesley is going to tell you all sorts of things about Professor Hutchinson that you can find out in his biography that are very professional and very serious. Professor Wesley and I, I, we divide our tasks oftentimes. Sometimes he's the velvet glove, sometimes I'm the iron fist, sometimes I'm the velvet glove, sometimes he's the iron fist, as the dean will attest. Um, but you know, we, we often divide tasks. So we're so we're gonna divide this task tonight in introducing Professor Hutchinson, and I'm gonna give you a little dish, right? I promise you a little, a little more personal dish about Professor Hutchinson. Um, and so you know, a little dish I shall serve. Um, and I'm going to tell you a few things about Professor Hutchinson that you would not know from his professional biography, but you would only know if you're a critical race theory stan who hangs out at the Lat Crit Hospitality Suite. Um, and I promise it's all above the board, Darren. It's I, I promise. Um, the first thing I'm going to tell you, in addition to being a proud dad of two black labs who are beautiful, um, he is a social media star to be reckoned with. His daily insights on social media are followed by many, many, many people. And, you know, he's helped me through more than one national race, race related crisis. Um, and I follow him and you should too. I've written his Twitter at Dissenting J and Dissenting Justice on Facebook. So that's the first thing I wanted to tell you. The second thing I want to tell you, and I think Professor Hutchinson will blush when I say that, he is stylish. I mean, really stylish. If he were here in person, we would be treated to a carefully selected, intentionally curated look that would leave us breathless till tomorrow. <laughs> From shoes to suits to ties, perhaps even a waistcoat and an ascot, um, Professor Hutchinson has a one-of-a-kind aesthetic flair that transcends dandy and embraces the sublime nature of looking fine when you are taking your people to church. And I sincerely hope he takes us to church today um, in that way. Third, Professor Hutchinson is funny. 
He has a wicked sense of humor and great comedic timing. And those of us who follow him on social media or into the hospitality suite at Lat Crit and various race organizations have been treated to his wit and his charm on more than one occasion and more than one late night. So if you can have a drink with him or take a class with him, I highly recommend it. Finally, and this is kind of a more personal thing, and Professor Hutchinson may not remember this moment, but I remember it. Professor Hutchinson is extraordinarily generous and kind, even when he has no reason to be. I first met Professor Hutchinson as a junior, as a baby crit at a lat crit conference, maybe it was my second one, and he was speaking with another firecracker luminary, Professor Anthony Farley of Albany Law School. They beckoned me over, included me in their jokes, and made me feel very welcome, even though Professor Hutchinson didn't know me at all. And at the end of our brief encounter, he offered to read my work and mentor me without knowing me at all. And they offered me to gather strategies for success and support at a time when I was still finding my way. Professor Hutchinson is brilliant and generous and a generative pillar of the critical race theory community and a leading light. I'm so grateful for him. And I'm so grateful he's here today. And now I'll pass the dish to Professor Wesley, uh, and he will give you some of the professional highlights. Not, not a lot. I have, don't have a lot more to say, but I just wanted to say that I recently came to realize that nearly everything that I teach is now part of the culture wars. Therefore, when I learned that Professor Darren Hutchinson agreed to be our next Dreyfus lecturer, I was very excited to hear his views on how we should address and analyze the current moment of national division in which we find ourselves. Professor Hutchinson is uniquely qualified to speak to the current impasse in which the teaching of American history is confused with teaching racial hatred and which an African-American AP course is rejected because it seeks to educate students about the need for reparative justice and the relevance of recognizing the role that LGBT people of color played in the civil rights movement. And the teaching of critical race theory is banned by state governments for imaginary harms conjured by those who know nothing about what such courses actually are about. Professor Darren Hutchinson serves as the John Lewis Chair for Civil Rights and Social Justice at Emory University. He is an acclaimed legal scholar and social justice advocate whose work forces, focuses on and analyzes and remedying in inequality. His lecture is titled Anti-Anti-Racism, Resistance, Backlash, and Resiliency. His lecture tonight kicks off the Tulane Law School's Black Law Alumni Reunion Weekend. And without further ado, I'm happy to present you Professor Darren Hutchinson. Thank you so much um, for those introductions. Uh, this is really great detail, both the professional and the not so professional. There's a little tidbit that I was surprised Robert didn't mention. My very first workshop as an academic was at Tulane back in, I don't even know what the year was. I think it was 1998, I'm gonna say, cause I think I was three years behind you. Um, I remember I got in a job, I was so excited. And here's this person calling me, Robert was, we used the phone back then. So <laughs> Robert called me and left a message saying, asking if I wanted to speak on a panel. And um, I, I found a very supportive environment. I often told people about that at the beginning of my career, how wonderful um, the conference was that Robert and a few others organized at Tulane and how it really, really, made me feel that I had a community of scholars who could support me. So I just wanted to definitely add that um, um, tidbit in there. It was such a, a great professional highlight. Um, another thing I want to do is to apologize for not being able to be there. Um, I, I've been struggling with some health issues, and um, even though I uh, have the strength to present, I was just not able to travel today. So I hope that you will forgive me, especially after we canceled last year's because of 
COVID and allergies and all of those things that were going on. But I think this what what this what the delays tell me is this event is meant to be. <laughs> no matter how many people are there, whether I'm in person or not, um, we have some important things to talk about. And the interesting thing is, um, whatever I'm presenting is even more important now. All right, the the subject matter was always relevant, but since um, the, the invitation, since I received the invitation, things have grown even more grim in the country with respect to social justice. And when I use the social justice label, I am speaking very broadly about race, sexual orientation, gender, gender identity, et cetera. Um, as, as Robert mentioned in his introduction, we have a situation now where governors reminiscent of the 1950s are, are banning courses related to racial justice, are banning courses on African-American history, doing so proudly, not as, you know, uh, they had a strained conversation with advisors and decided to go that way, but doing so proudly, both as a very um, cynical way of getting voters, but also as a way of rallying white nationalism across the country. And those are the elements of the conversation I want to um, have with you tonight. So the title of the conversation coined two years ago is called Anti-Anti-Racism. And a lot of people find that a very curious title. And I think just to not hold you in suspense, I'm gonna tell you what um, guided my thinking. Um, and, and by telling you what guided my thinking, I'll give you some a roadmap to where we're gonna go in the discussion. So after, actually I'll start, I was gonna start with Trump's election, but I'll back up to George Floyd. All right, so George Floyd was a pinnacle moment in national history, but also international history. Protests around police violence, um, criminal um, injustice, and also uh, mass incarceration and poverty were held throughout the United States, but also um, nationally. And it was a very rich historical moment to observe. And but they also provoked um, a very powerful backlash, all right, a very powerful backlash um, led by many officials, including President Trump, who said that governors should respond with the greatest force possible to shut down the protests and also um, use tear gas at, at the at, in Washington against protesters who were um, demanding change. So all of that started happening. And then after he lost the election, we started seeing these pieces of legislation sprouting up across the country. And every day it was another piece. It was, and all of them, most of them were geared towards critical race theory. But if you dig more deeply, some of them in, um, go against feminist theory, then they started including LGBT, LGBTQ rights. And the goal of those was to wipe those um, field of studies out of public schools and also to stigmatize people who would teach them, chilling their ability to act as educators. All right, so when I, I started hearing that, I'm like, what's going on? All right, I always like to think that way. What is going on? Because one thing we can do in this social media world where everything is rapid response, we can sort of think of things as one by one. All right. So every time something new happens, oh, look what look what Governor DeSantis did today. Oh, look what this person did today. But at some point, as a scholar and an activist, I like to step back and say there's something that's not individual systemic. Um, effort, a collusive effort to um, harm just critical race theory, but anti-racism itself. Um, and some people say, well, you're being redundant because critical race theory is anti-racism. But the point is, this is not just about attacking a field of study. It's not just about attacking an American history course. This is about 
um, ridding anti-racism from schools, stigmatizing people of color, and to erase all gains that we've obtained throughout history from anti-racist struggle. And that's what I want to focus on today is the elements of this backlash that occurred in 2020, primarily a response to the George Floyd protests, but also a response to perceived political losses due to Trump losing the presidential election and shifting uh, um, demographics of the United States, causing um, a lot of anxiety among whites about um, their destiny and their ability to retain political power in the future. Um, those are the elements, those are the causes of the backlash. I want to talk about how they have been operationalized. But and before I go into how they've been operationalized, I want to say, I want to pull one common theme from them. And the operationalization of them has centered around free speech, interestingly. Um, these laws banning um, certain types of education, you could easily litigate that as a First Amendment issue. And people of color have turned to the courts in the past to litigate First Amendment concerns or speech concerns. Uh, an interesting point of that history, however, is that there's some tension or at least imagined tension between um, civil liberties like speech and equality like racial equality or racial justice. Um, and the most grotesque form of that argument occurred in the Dred Scott decision where slave owners or slavers um, claimed that efforts by Congress to de-establish slavery in parts of the country deprived them of their right to property um, guaranteed by the Constitution. But we've seen that um, at later points in history as well. Uh, similar arguments were made during the civil rights movement. Um, uh, members of Congress who objected to the legislation said that it would deprive um, employers of their liberty of contract because now they could not discriminate on the basis of sex or race. So there has been this tension. And for all of you who have um, at least studied constitutional law, you know that the Supreme Court has decided a lot of cases on this subject matter, uh, ranging from, like I said, Dred Scott, all the way to a lot of cases challenging the civil rights legislation as soon as they were enacted, viewing them as an affront to um, uh, Southern um, citizenship. All right, so that's the interesting thing is this tension between speech and um, social justice exists, but I think it's plainly obvious from the way in which um, the strategy of backlash has evolved is that the two things do not have to exist in tension. In fact, speech is, is essential for social justice. I, I'm gonna just say that speech is essential for social justice. But I also want to um, ask people to, who believe this is just about free speech to think with a broader lens. Um, there are a lot of these pieces of legislation I'm about to discuss have been viewed primarily or exclusively as First Amendment issues. Um, and I think that that devalues what is going on here, all right? It's not just telling people they can't say certain things. This is an effort to um, muzzle anti-racism, to punish um, Black intellectuals, and to um, dampen a reinvigorated civil rights movement um, that has been seen in Black Lives Matter and other uh, movements championed by younger generations of Americans. All right, so that's, I wanna start the talk on that level. Just think about this conflict, think about how the conflict really is an imaginary conflict. And also for those who are civil liberties champions, think about how social justice is an important element of this discussion. So where do we begin? Well, there are so many places to begin, um, but I want to talk about um, the um, uh, 
ratified and the rejection of the election. All right, as soon as um, the election ended, there were efforts to discredit it, multiple, numerous efforts to discredit the election. And we also got in very Jim Crow fashion, meaning all of the Southern states together passed legislation that made it harder for people of color to vote. We also saw a lot of legislation that was designed to chill anti-racist political activism. And an example would be laws that would immunize drivers who ran into protesters in streets, right? And although that's racially neutral, it's obvious that they were challenging and trying to weaponize um, drivers um, against Black Lives Matter. And a fourth component of that, which I've already talked about, is um, attacking anti-racist intellectuals. But since I've started this paper, it's now attacking anti-racism very broadly, including courses in K through 12, at colleges and universities. And for those who are at state schools, this is a very difficult issue. For those at private schools, we have some um, space from it, but I don't think um, the state governments will stop um, with public schools. I think they will bring this movement into private schools as well. All of these things together, right? Um, making it harder to vote, making it tougher to mobilize politically, um, making it tougher to engage in anti-racist uh, speech and intellectual studies um, is a attack on speech. All of these things are attack on speech. We haven't actually said that the right to vote is a First Amendment right, but I am one of those activists who believes it is and believes definitely now that we need to codify and constitutionalize um, voting as a both a um, due process right and as a, um, a speech right. Uh, so all of this is going on. Delegitimize the election and um, well anti-racist activism. We then <clears throat> move into a scenario where these operations are growing much further than simply the policies at school boards, et cetera. And now we're seeing people punished um, for engaging in activity that threatens the status quo. For example, and it's so early, it's so recent, it's been hard for me to actually present a research um, basis of this, but the, the effort to get rid of um, AP studies in high schools um, look at that moment, even if, all right, so first of all, it's it's appalling that, it, but even if, right, he wasn't able to do it, we came back and said, this violates whatever legal principle. I can think of Title VI of the um, Civil Rights Act of 1964. Even if that happened, imagine people on the ground who teach in Florida thinking that they can talk about anti-racism in the classroom. That's why I want to take you to the practical impact of that. Even if that policy is overturned, you have thousands of teachers now who will be very afraid, if they weren't already, to talk about race. And that impact is very broad. Again, it's a speech effect, but it also has a social justice effect because it it prevents um, discussion among young people about how their future should look. And to me, I think that's the absolute, um, one of the absolute fears in these policies is that it's a fear that young people will sit down and imagine a different United States, right? And what's my evidence for that? If you look at a lot of the legislation and the policies, the argument was that it will teach children to be upset about their race, all right? Or it will teach children to be ashamed of their race, or it will teach children to be racist. 
And one question I have, and I, and I ask you, uh, uh, educated audience, have you seen any evidence of that? <laughs> there is not one moment where a child has said, I am now racist because I heard about racism in the past. Or a child saying that I feel bad being white because I learned about what my ancestors did in the past. I think it's a, a, an epic form of projection, right? What's going on here is they're afraid not that children will be embarrassed about being white, but they will be embarrassed about racism and may want to change it. And so actually that is the purpose of it. And you can see it by looking into the policy themselves where the goal is to not get rid of discussions of but discussions of systemic racism, right? And that is the heart of what critical race theory is. Critical race theory is a body of literature that opposes systemic racism, not simply individual prejudice. And if you dig through, which I have done, the policies in most of the states that have them, that is the goal. The fear is, and the opposition is to, instruction related to racism as an organizing principle in the United States. All right, and so that's what they're trying to blot out or wipe out of American history, of uh, social studies, uh, political science, etc. And that is an, an extremely um, important moment, an extremely dangerous moment because it harkens back um, to similar efforts historically. And as I see, as I'm gonna go into that now, but as I see these policies happening, like, does anyone see that they are simply replicating the past? A very nasty, a very ugly, a very harmful and shameful past. And we can start as early as laws during enslavement that prevented instruction or teaching of reading to enslaved persons, right? It was illegal to instruct um, a slave how to read or how to, or to attend school. Those laws um, passed, those laws existed even after enslavement then they morphed into other laws which banned organizing among people of color. So it would be illegal, for example, for people of color to meet together um, in public in order to do anything. But normally the fear was that people of color were meeting together to organize against white supremacy. Another piece of that story about um, about banning speech in a way that harkens back to the past is um, laws banning the distribution of abolitionist materials. Right? And so there's a long history of that where the postmaster general, the president were all angry about abolitionist material being distributed. Um, it was a crime. It was something that was enforced. They took the materials and um, treated them as contraband. That's how um, important the opposition, all right, the pro-slavery movement viewed speech in terms of the liberation of Black people. And it's an example, I think, that we can follow today when we examine this issue. It's not just about speech. This is tied to a broad effort to um, subjugate and oppress uh, people of color. And because I have studied these issues from multiple angles, racism, gender, et cetera, I can bring in other elements to this. Some of the same things happen with respect to queer movements when they began organizing, all right? There is an effort to um, take away queer materials that were being distributed through the mills. And the argument was that it was obscene. And there was a litigation all the way to the Supreme Court that reversed that ruling. So this is a constant 
constant effort among um, privileged classes to subordinate um, um, to subordinate disempowered groups. And it's something that, again, I believe that we should follow the continuity in assessing how we approach these things today. Um, the other very, uh, the other issue I wanna go into besides the teaching of critical race theory is voting. And this is one that's not received as much attention, I think, as it should. But at the moment, there's a movement to sort of diminish the democracy that we've tried to build. So I'm just going to put it out there on the outset. We don't have a real democracy. And there are many things that elements that we can point to in our political system that prove that, right? So it's, it's very popular to say that Rhode Island has the same number of senators as California, right? And that the popular vote winner of the presidential election has not become president twice recently, that being Hillary Clinton and Al Gore. So uh, we don't have um, a, an actual democracy. And on some level, we can debate whether that should, ha should happen, all right? So there's some arguments that you should have some flexibility so that smaller and un unrepresented populations of people have a voice, all right? And you obtain that with these mechanisms like um, equal representation in the Senate and um, the Electoral College. On the other hand, it's very clear from social science evidence and data today that these mechanisms are burdening people of color. All right, it's, it ends up having a racist impact. So when we look at the smaller states that have augmented representation in the Senate and how the Electoral College is distributed, the losers in that situation are people of color. And that prevents us from having national change on many fronts, um, including the right to vote. So that is, a starting out with that, we have to just acknowledge that we're not in the state of democracy already, but efforts to get us there, all right? So we've had a lot of democratization over time and history. Those efforts are being eroded tremendously. All right, um, and we talk about Shelby. Shelby was decided um, a decade ago, right? So it's it's, it's now a, a new moment where even the Voting Rights Act, which was always interpreted as having um, an anti a disparate impact um, um, component to it, where not just actual explicit racial discrimination was covered, but policies having a racially disparate effect were covered, it's being whittled down by the Supreme Court. So proving racism um, in the electoral process is becoming much harder to do. All right, that's number one. Number two, there's a battle, especially in red states with respect to state control over elections. And this is something that's existed for a while, but it's become much more salient today um, after Trump's claims that the election was stolen or rigged from him. There are several state legislatures that were threatening to um, review the election and reverse the results of the election as certified by their state election officials. Um, okay, so we can think of that as one little moment in time, but that's not the case. So there's a case before the Supreme Court now that will consider the state legislature um, control doctrine, which is basically asserts that state legislatures have control over state elections. Um, the Constitution said states, but What's happening is that in some states, their Supreme Court or constitutions are attempting to make preserve democracy. All right. And Phil, Pennsylvania became a, a landmark state for that. So, Pennsylvania Supreme Court during the 2020 election um, made a lot of decisions that augmented the power of people to do absentee balloting. And there's a lot of litigation there. 
The Supreme Court didn't reach the fine the merits of that decision, right? But um, now there's a case that presents the merits again, such that state legislatures, not the Supreme, not the state Supreme Court, should have the last say on election laws within those states. If that is um, decided in favor of the states, it could present a, a calamity. I mean, it's really hard to find adjectives to describe the situation that could result, but just imagine, all right, red state legislatures saying that they're upset with the vote. They think it was rigged. They don't have any evidence of that, but they're using their authority um, embraced by the Supreme Court state election and install their own state electors. So the electoral college will be in their favor. So we're lopping on um, undemocratic principles on top of an un already undemocratic system. All of this is going on at the same time. We're operating on full burners. Everything is burning at the same time. So this is a moment, I tell my students, this is a moment in history where no one should feel that, um, feel complacent. There's just no, no space for anyone to pause and not pay attention or hope it just settles itself and goes away. The decisions that are being made now um, in courts that are being made in state legislatures and municipal government, they will determine how social justice lives um, for a long period of time. Um, I don't know how much more time I have, but I do want to go into one final piece. Yes. Yes. I just, I just, okay, yes. Um, a lot of people ask, you know, like, so what should we do? <laughs> and I remember a speaker once saying, well, you know, I didn't come prepared to solve um, six centuries of racism in one night, but here's some ideas I have. <laughs> so, but, um, I, you know, I don't want to leave you disappointed, but what can we do is all the tried and tested measures of the past. First of all, we have some mechanisms that we've created. There are ways to attack the policies that are coming up. And some of those uh, have been very successful in terms of litigation, right? So suing under federal law to block the anti-CRT um, bills, that has worked even in the state of Florida that has worked. Um, so do, legislative um, effort to make sure they don't keep copping, propping up and spreading across the nation. And some people say, well, that's so treacherous, but I, I, I was one who was shocked when the South Carolina Supreme Court struck down their state's um, anti-abortion law of all places, right? So you have to try, all right? In Georgia, another red state with a very um, severe anti-abortion law, that has been invalidated, at least in round one. So it's going to go up to the Georgia Supreme Court eventually. So we're seeing very interesting things on the ground, but people had to keep fighting. All right, so that's number one. We have to use the tools that are there. We also have to create new tools. We have to reimagine the tools that are there. All right, and what, one thing that comes to mind to me is um, abortion. All right, so I'll go back to that issue. We really have to reimagine how we talk about abortion in this country. So yes, it is a liberty interest. It's a right of personal autonomy, but it is also something that is very important to social justice. All right, so broadly thinking about inequality and the examples I can give is how women of color, indigenous women, and poor women have been affected by um, the decision by the Supreme Court and then the subsequent um, repeal of abortion rights across the nation. The people on the front lines, front lines of injury, front lines of victims are women of color. Why? Because they to use abortion services more than other women in the country. 
All right, um, and so we really need to reimagine, as, as feminists of color have been doing for decades now, how we um, conceptualize um, choice. Is it about just choice itself? Or, uh, or, excuse me, is it about choice in the sense of physical and individual autonomy or more about a group-based autonomy? Another thing to think about staying on that particular issue is whether um, this is just about a right not to be pregnant, right? Some of those women who are poor and of color would like to have families, right? So why should we have a society where um, it's either abortion or having a disastrous um, family life where you can't support your children? I would say that in my version of due process, all right, says that we don't leave women with those choices. We interpret the due process clause to require the government to provide those services to women so that they can sustain families and not just choose whether or not to be pregnant or not. Instead, it should be, do you want to have a family? And if you Um, the final piece would be, we have to live with um, injustice. And I, let me make sure, because there will be a sound by Professor Hutchinson says we need to live with injustice. <laughs> that's, not, that's not exactly where I want to go. What I'm saying is we have to live with defeats and um, the cycle of fighting racism. What I've learned over the years and just studying history and my own life experiences is that racism morphs, all right? Racism is one of the most resilient things ever. I, I look at it like an oncologist looking at cancer and how it can morph and shift around. And racism is like that. It really can change. Period of time, we're talking about slavery. Then we're talking about the black codes with police. And, and now here we are talking about critical race theory, but it's all about the same thing, anti-anti-racism and racism can morph and we need to be resilient, right? In order to fight those battles, which requires a lot of patience. It requires a lot of struggle. It requires you to pick up yourself. Um, there is a new movement that I'm trying to become a part of. I guess I should say I am a part of to think about the psychological impact of racism and racial resisting racism. Uh, there's a lot of literature on this subject and it overwhelmingly shows that experiencing racism, struggling against racism can operate as a trauma. All right, it can create a trauma, which means it affects how you operate even if you're not experiencing new racism. And that's one of the most frightening things. I say that, what's the connection to this and social struggle? I, well, the connection is you need to take time to heal yourselves at some point. It's extraordinarily important um, in fighting this battle. And our ancestors did that before in the past. They talked about taking care of themselves and they did so through various things. It could be religion for you. It could be um, social gatherings and creating cultural traditions that are broad, but it's extraordinarily important if you want to fight this battle for social justice to, to renew yourself. And I'm actually begin learning that because I, you know, I grew up in a household where um, you don't say no. <laughs> You're always fighting, you're always pushing. And still, even today, I feel guilty saying no. Like literally, I feel guilty saying I can't make the conference today because we're supposed to be working. You're a part of the team, you have to keep marching. Um, but we have to we have to be able to pull back from those attitudes in order to have a chance to 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 be part of this movement. And I do want to close with just insight from so many of our leaders have said this, but John Lewis, I think, put it the right way. Um, when 
he was talking to young Americans in the Black Lives Matter movement who were, you know, reasonably and very rationally very angry with why are we still fighting this battle? All right, so you know the the sign at the at the march that says why are we still dealing with this? <laughs> uh, fill in the blank. Um, the thing they didn't know is we had those signs in the eighties <laughs> in our marches too. Why are we still dealing with this? And so, but one thing he said is, um, liberation is not an event. It's not a moment. And it, that just really meant so much to me to hear those words because that's now how I'm trying to view social justice. It's not something that, hey, we finally get to. We finally did it. We have social justice. Why? Because racism can is resilient. Racism will come back too. So we have to keep fighting um, the forces that want to maintain a racially hierarchical society. All right, and, and that to some people sounds very empty. It's like, we just have to keep fighting, but that's reality. That's the point of the beginning where I said, we're gonna have to live with reality. That is reality, right? It's a sad reality, but it's also to me inspiring, knowing that I always have something else to contribute to this battle is, is inspiring and keeps me going forward. And I just want to close now by saying I hope I've given you some inspiration for going forward. And I definitely look forward to Q&A. And I'm willing to sit here as long as you have questions. Okay, so the Dean said that we have uh, 10 minutes for Q&A. And what I suggest is if you have a question, you come down to the mic so you can be heard. Anyone has a question? Go ahead. I'll just kneel. Um, <laughs> thank you for uh, speaking to us today. Um, I do have a question about uh, the coverage of, I guess there's no reason on it right now, but of the uh, DeSantis crusade on critical race theory as reading the New York Times yesterday. And the headline said, I'm paraphrasing here, I tried looking it up, um, DeSantis takes on the educational establishment and builds his brand or something along those lines. And I was wondering, um, what do we do? Or do you find there is a form of, I can never say this word right, complicity uh, in the media of how we frame uh, anti-racist matters? And thank you. When you, when you say complicity, all right, so, oh, but you've left the, the microphone. I was trying to say, <laughs> what do you mean by complicity and how we frame it? Um, um, right. I suppose the editorialized version of the headline of saying, oh, this is a terrible thing that is happening, being framed as challenging the educational establishment as if educators are a political force instituting oppression rather than, you know, um, education. All right, I got you, I got you. So yeah, I, I actually saw that um, title, I was too busy to dig into the article, but thank you for looking in. I, I hope you read the article too. Um, the, we, 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 but there's a lot of we's here. There's the media we, there's activists we, general public we, I absolutely can be complicit. And one thing I said in response to DeSantis's behavior recently is that um, it's not just about DeSantis, it's how we respond to him, all right, and respond to what is happening. So it's, it's at the end of the day, the story could be just from mixing all of the we's together, DeSantis is a racist. Well, we already know that. So the question then becomes, what do we do to keep people from supporting him? 
Are we going to normalize him the way that we normalize Trump? Are we going to so, sort of coddle his supporters by saying they have economic anxiety? We're going to get to the meat of the issues. How are we going to um, um, assess and um, measure the response by Republicans? Because as grotesque as his positions have become, has become, I don't see any Republican opposition to them, right? I, I'm trying to see Republican leaders who are saying DeSantis is going too far, and I don't see that. So there's a lot there, but yeah, I, I agree with you saying that this is some type of establishment that teachers who want to are trying to indoctrinate students. So that is that is an old tool book, <laughs> extraordinarily old, and and it's it is shameful or unfortunate that the journalist chose that title for for the article. But to your point, absolutely need to think um, more broadly than just DeSantis himself, but also to um, how we treat the people who end up supporting him. Because he's often, he's often um, offered as sort of a milder form of Trump. And I, I'm actually doubting that now because where are we now, February, 2023? If he's in February, 2023, he's already with banning AP courses. I, I don't see how much milder he's going to be um, than Trump when the election comes around. I mean, he is he's pretty hardcore in, in my perspective. Um, but it is dangerous, I think, to sort of play along with him and normalizing his movements is just taking on the establishment or a governor's control of state resources related to education when it's really about white nationalism. And, and so I do I share your fear that um, reporting and public responses to him could veer in that direction in, in many ways like, like it did regarding Trump in 2016. Thank you. Thank you. Additional questions? Good evening. Since you're at a private school and we're at a private school, um, I'd like to ask for your thoughts on, uh, since you anticipate that this sort of um, Antis fever will spread um, beyond the state universities, how the response to that in a private university setting should be different or the same. Question. I, I think on some level the response could be the same. It could be, so for example, if the state said that any school, private or otherwise, receiving state assistance on any level um, could be subject to the same restriction, then um, the response could be a First Amendment response or an equal protection response, et cetera. Um, there, the differences are the magnitude of state funding for private schools is very different. Uh, so, for example, the state of Georgia cut every fund that it gave to Emory. I'm not going to say that we'd be happy, <laughs> but it wouldn't it wouldn't have the same impact as it would as at the University of Georgia. And I, I, I'm pretty safe in saying the same story would be there for Tulane versus LSU, for example. Um, but I, I I don't think I can't see DeSantis in fact stopping. I can see it going to private schools in the state. Florida doesn't have that many private schools anyway. Louisiana certainly does. Georgia does. And I, I think we're going to have to pull up those same strategies. But in the onset, the calculation of as to whether or not it's worth it could be different than a state school because of the, the magnitude of funding. We have more questions. Hi, so uh, thank you for this talk. Um, it got me thinking about something that I've been working a little bit on, and, I, and this is something that I think uh, will resonate with you as soon as I say it. Um, 
I've been looking at the way in which states like Texas and other states have started to regulate in a very violent way affirmative care for transgender youth. Um, and the ways in which they uh, they have used, you know, weaponized the ordinary police power, state regulatory power, you know, that we just use to regulate professionals, regulate doctors, regulate lawyers, you know, they've weaponized it in this kind of really reactionary and terrifying way. So they've set up across the country a battle between experts and, you know, education and expertise and professionalism versus like the Yahoo's. You know, and it used to be, you know, when I was a girl in the 80s and my parents were doing free sales Africa, you know, it used to be kind of like universities and teachers and doctors had a certain kind of authority. And the states would say like, well, we don't like what you guys do, but we recognize that you have an expertise beyond what we know about, it, you know, whereas Texas is now kind of like, screw you, Academy of Pediatrics, we know better, which is just to me. Um, and so I'm wondering, you know, because I see these things all together. I see the critical race theory and the affirmative care and the, you know, um, you can't, don't say gay. I see them as all kind of this way, like the experts in the professional class have decided a certain thing about the nature of justice and the nature of inclusion. And we've all adopted a certain party line. And they're like, we see your adoption and we raise you state legislation. It might not be unconstitutional, but it will ruin you until it's declared that way. So I don't know if you see those things as connected and what we can do for people in Florida. I mean, we're not in Florida anymore. I mean, I'm extraordinarily worried about the race crits and the, and the, the LGBTQ folks in places like Florida and Texas. Even the doctors. I mean, they're talking about criminalizing doctors in Texas. So, you know, so two, two kind of questions. Do you see these things as connected? And then number two, um, what do we do for people in these states? Um, our, even our colleagues here in Louisiana. Very good. As soon as you stood up, I said, oh, here comes the hardest question of the night. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, absolutely, I see it as connected. Um, absolutely. So the timing shows a connection. Um, there are so many different ways that youth of color are more subjected to surveillance generally, and we're going to see that with trans youth of color. Um, the violence that trans people of color already face, this certainly resonates um, with the way the state is um, characterizing um, their necessary care. Um, and also, it's just part of this systemic effort. I can call it anti-anti-racism, but I keep forgetting I'm thinking multidimensionality. Racism already includes all of this stuff to me. Um, it, absolutely, um, the, the this is part of a systemic effort to strengthen um, privilege and to um, also make it more difficult for people who are subordinate. And just to follow up on the, the piece that you talked about ignoring science, I think the roots are already there. I mean, we now have people who are pr um, proudly subjecting themselves to COVID and dying because they did their own research. I mean, it's like, and lawmakers are, are encouraging uh, that behavior to ignore science. So and when it comes to something that may be even more a little complicated for them to understand, such as um, transgender medical care, um, it's it's easy to manipulate those folks into um, thinking that the government um, has the authority to do what it does when absolutely no legitimate medical association agrees with what tech what it is trying to do with respect to trans Jews. None. And the, the interesting thing is if you read the case law, since I'm talking to a room of lawyers, it's almost all unanimous on um, the, the type of care that trans youth need in order to be healthy um, young adults. And, and the citations to all of the medical officials around the world, this is a global thing. And it's like unanimity. Uh, you can't really fight it, so but they don't have to fight it because apparently they've done their own research. That is a frightening thing. That is absolutely frightening. And, and I think as an academic, as a person who loves 
puzzles. And uh, as a kid, I used to always just, all I did was read. I was such a nerd. It was crazy. I love to read. I love to solve problems. I, I just, that was just in me at a very early age. That was the one thing I think I trusted in our society that um, people who were scientists, who were actual scientists, we trusted their decisions. There was something called data. All right, when <laughs> we tended to, to follow it. Um, statistics couldn't prove anything. Like I just knew there was actually an answer. Now, and it's hard to find the answer, but now we're saying when we find the answer, we don't have to believe it. And that is extraordinarily dangerous because a lot of oppression has been built around um, lies mapped masquerading as science. So we're taking a situation where scientists have actually said the right thing, but we're going back to those old tropes of science is... Um, inferior or we have to create our own science in order to, um, to, 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 to advance our own agendas. And that, that absolutely, the impact of that, the collateral consequences just could spread across so many different spaces, so many different spaces, it's extraordinarily dangerous. And I think it was, I'm trying to see who I heard talk about this, it was probably Dorothy Roberts who um, did a lecture on, I, intellectual nature of these movements. So it's not just political movements that are targeting people based on identity, um, class, et cetera. There's a way in which they are all suppressing um, thought, intellectual thought. And you see that in the suppression of what can be taught in classes. You see that in the ignoring of um, medical data, um, you see that ignoring what social scientists say about poverty and racism, the entire concept of systemic racism, which is basically the only concept used in the social sciences. I mean, sociologists talking about systemic racism is just a basic concept. And the scientist says that that doesn't exist legally in Florida. And so, yeah, absolutely dangerous. But that means that we need to be louder and bolder in our strategies. I think we have time for one more question. Okay, just listening to you speak makes me think that we are so often speaking to people who we already agree with on some of these issues. And so do you have any thoughts about how we can get out of our bubbles, not necessarily to convince people on the opposite extreme, but in the persuadable margins? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, we have such a divided society. Um, and so the one problem you have in trying to reach people across the divide is that previously intellectual arguments are now partisan arguments. All right, so it's hard to get people to shift if they if they view the issue as one of Democrats versus Republicans or liberals versus Democrats. So they're just going to hold on to it regardless of. Started teaching. I taught in Dallas, Texas, um, and I had moved from Brooklyn, New York. All right. Um, and I can say not a really receptive audience, <laughs> but I learned, this is what I learned, especially to law students. So law students are a different beast. They're in the bubble, but they're not all in the, it's not the same bubble everywhere. There are a lot of very conservative law students who are interested in learning. Like, and I sit there, I taught my critical race theory class yesterday, and there, there are a couple of white men in the class who just had never heard of the, never been exposed to the literature that we we're teaching. Um, they weren't approaching anything as, uh, I should say, partisans. It was more like, I never knew that, right? And we have to reach, I think those are some of the people we have to reach, right, is the the people who are actually open to learning, right? And 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 I always tell students that look, you can be liberal and you and learn. Like it's not like you're 
What I love, my favorite line in the my class is when the so-called progressive student says, I already know this stuff. I'm like, well, your judge is not going to be a CRT scholar. So, so learn how to make the argument yourself. Like everyone can learn. And I think that's who we reach. A lot of conversations with folks like that, I believe, can work. Um, at the end of the day, um, we have to always remember that it's not just about reasoning so inequality in this country is not just one of a lack of a good argument to make. That's 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 the problem that I as an academic who likes to solve problems, et cetera, had to face early on, is that these problems are more they're an exercise of power, right? It's an exercise of power. So it the battle can't be won simply by showing everyone, hey, here's systemic, systemic racism is real, it's encoded in our legal system, it's pervasive. Yeah, some people might get that and change, but a lot of this is about power, um, systemic racism, social dominance, which are things that are really hard to sort of intellectualize your way out of. Uh, and so that that, I think, is a problem on the other side, that even um, even with the good information, a lot of it is just rooted in power, and it's hard to get people to to, to release that. And that's why race anti-racism is viewed as a zero-sum game right, in today's society, um, because of that notion of, of power that exists around it. So we should thank our speaker one more time. And I believe there's a reception across the hall in the multi-purpose room. Is that right? Okay. And Thank everyone. you, everyone. Um, have some nice, have some nice hors d'oeuvres and a glass of wine. <laughs> and a glass of white wine for, for me. Absolutely. And I really, really, really hope that I can come to Tulane again one day. It was the, it was the launching of my career. I really have fond memories of that time period. So. I hope that I can get back down there in person again. Thank you so much, Darren.